Koite. Welcome to Lesson 7. Um, I'm really sorry about canceling our live meeting today. Um, one good thing about the pandemic, I guess, is that just not being with people, I haven't had a cold or any kind of sickness since March. I think usually I'd be on my second or third cold of the winter, but um, I woke up with a bad headache today, so I'm already feeling better. Thank you for those of you who uh, reached out in the comments or by email. Um, that's very sweet, and I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to walk you through the lesson. I'm going to ask you to pause at several times during the video um, to complete your notes document. And I'll try to be really clear about what I'm going to be checking for a grade for this cycle. These are our objectives. I can define cyclin and describe their role in regulating the cell cycle. I can define mutagen, oncogene, and metastasis, primary tumor, and secondary tumor. And I can calculate calculate a mitotic index and explain its applications. Um, take a look at these warm-up questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and please type your answers to the warm-up questions in your notes document. So pause this video, answer the questions, and that's something I'll be checking for your asynchronous assignment. The first thing to talk about is a mitotic index, a mitotic index. And that's just the ratio of cells in mitosis to the total number of cells within a given tissue sample. And so the equation is just the number of cells in mitosis divided by the total number of cells. Um, so why would we want to calculate mitotic index? Well, mitotic index gives us information about what's going on in a population of cells. Um, so, for example, you would expect part of an organism that's growing to have a much higher mitotic index um, compared to part of an organism that's not growing. Um, sometimes in the lab, um, people can look at the root tip of an onion or of anything that's growing a root, and you can compare the mitotic index of that part that's growing um, compared to a part that's not growing. And of course, you would expect a much higher mitotic index in the part that's growing because those cells are dividing. But a lot more importantly, uh, clinically, you might want to look at a cancerous tumor and look at the mitotic index um, of that tumor, because that's going to tell you, you know, how fast those cells are dividing and growing um, and how aggressive that tumor is. So doctors are going to make different decisions about the care of the patient and the treatment that the patient will have, uh, depending on how fast that tumor is growing, um, which could tell you about how likely it is to spread. So you're going to go to your notes document. For each of these cells, please write down whether they're in prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, or interphase. Um, and then you're going to calculate the mitotic index um, for this population of cells. And again, that's the number of cells in any phase of mitosis all over the total number of cells in the sample. So pause this video and do that now. Remember these reasons for cells to divide. So growth, um, organisms are getting bigger. Uh, for unicellular organisms, this is how they reproduce asexually. Um, any kind of injury, we want to repair that tissue, or even tissue that's just old and worn out, we want to replace it with new cells. And then of course, embryonic development. So a fertilized egg um, goes to an entire organism because of cell division. Um, and it makes sense that we would really want this process to be regulated. So any kind of mistake in cell division could have real catastrophic consequences for the organism. Um, this, these are cool images with uh, fluorescent stains that are attaching to different parts of the cell. So DNA um, will take up one kind of fluorescent stain. Um, the proteins that make up the microtubules take up a different color. So here we can see interphase. We can see the condensation of the chromosomes in prophase. Um, here we see them start to get organized on that spindle fiber. Here they are at metaphase, totally lined up um, on that metaphase plate or the equator. And then here um, we have those chromosomes separating during anaphase. And then finally, um, you can see that the chromosomes are starting to decondense. Um, we can't really see the nuclear membrane, but we know that it's reforming, and that's telophase. Um, 
Your warm-up question asked you what would happen if anaphase started happening before all of the chromosomes were perfectly lined up in metaphase. Um, and hopefully you were able to think about, like, oh, if all the chromosomes weren't aligned correctly and attached to the spindle fiber correctly, um, when those spindle fibers started shortening and pulling apart the chromosomes, um, you're not going to have the right number on each side. You might have an extra on one side and a missing one on the other side, um, and that would be totally... Uh, devastating for that organism that's going to cause some very serious cell abnormality. So we want to make sure uh, that the cell cycle is regulated. Cancer is the result of dysregulation of the cell cycle. So often it's several mutations that sort of accumulate um, and result in this abnormal behavior of cells. So um, up here you can see normal cells here. Um, maybe these are skin cells and maybe um, this person spent too much time outside in the sun without um, sunscreen. So maybe there was a mutation in these cells um, causing them to become abnormal. So there's some kind of mutation that's made them different. Uh, and one thing that abnormal cells do that normal cells don't do um, is they stop sort of respecting uh, this thing called density dependent inhibition. So normal cells are like, okay, there's no more room, I'm gonna stop dividing. Like if you have a cut or scrape in your skin, um, those skin stem cells are gonna divide and sort of fill up the gap, but then they don't continue, right? After the there's no more room for them, they stop dividing. But that's a rule that abnormal cells break, um, and that's why cancerous cells will often create this mass called a tumor. Um, so this is a tumor. And then other abnormal things that these cells do um, is that they can produce um, growth hormones and signals that attract the growth of blood vessels. So that's called angiogenesis here. So the tumor is nourishing itself um, by making new blood vessels grow um, and supplying it with oxygen and nutrients. So some of the um, anti-cancer drugs will target this angiogenesis. So it'll try to stop the growth of these new blood vessels um, and starve out that tumor. Um, another target of cancer drugs is just rapidly dividing cells. So these cells that are dividing too quickly and abnormally, um, if we can kill rapidly dividing cells, then we might be able to kill those cancer cells. Um, and that's a reason why people who are undergoing chemotherapy uh, often lose their hair, because those hair follicle cells are also dividing quickly. So the um, drugs don't distinguish between hair follicles and cancer cells, they're just wiping out anything that's dividing quickly. Um, okay, metastasis is another vocabulary word that you should know. So this is where cells can break off of the primary tumor and they can travel either through the bloodstream or through your lymph vessels. Um, if you don't know too much about your lymphatic system, it's sort of like a parallel um, to your circulatory system. You might have heard about lymph nodes. You have a couple big ones in your neck. They might be kind of swollen if you're sick. Um, but anyway, lymph vessels and your blood vessels um, can both carry cancerous cells to a new location. Um, and if those cells kind of settle in the new location and if they can get um, enough sources of nutrients, they can grow and become a secondary tumor in that new location. So um, in summary, cancer is just uncontrolled cell growth and cell division. Um, and it's a result of the failure of the regulation of the cell cycle. Okay, I'm going to ask you to pause this video, um, and you're going to watch the Amoeba Sisters video. Um, you're going to answer the guiding questions in your notes document, and that's something I'm going to be checking. So, in what ways are cancer cells abnormal? How are they different than healthy cells? Uh, why are cellular checkpoints necessary? What would happen if these checkpoints did not exist? And what's the role of cyclins in regulating the cell cycle? So pause this video, please watch the Amoeba Sisters video, uh, and answer these questions in your notes document. Alright, in summary, how does the cell make sure that everything is ready to go for mitosis? How is the cell cycle regulated? So one thing that we need to understand um, is we need to understand that genes code for proteins. So in the DNA, in the nuclei of all of your cells, 
you have your entire um, genetic library. So you have the instructions for all of the proteins that any cells in your body can make. Um, certain cells are going to produce different sort of um, bouquets of proteins. They're going to produce different assortments of proteins um, that give them their identity as a cell. Um, but it's also true that your cells can produce different proteins at different times. So it's not just about what kind of cell they are, it's also about like what's going on and what are they responding to in the environment. So here's an example. Um, you have probably heard of insulin. If you have diabetes, there's a problem with your, the way that your body makes insulin, so you might have to take uh, supplementary in insulin by an injection or a pump. Um, but the idea here is that your body is not pumping out insulin all the time. Um, you will express those insulin genes at certain times and not others, meaning the insulin protein is getting made at certain times and not others. So um, insulin is produced in response to an increase in blood sugar. Um, so after you've had a meal, um, your digestive system is going to start to break down that food that you ate, um, and the glucose um, or sugar is going to pass into your bloodstream. And the response of your body is to produce that insulin. Um, by contrast, uh, if you've just woken up in the morning, um, you weren't eating while you were asleep, so you are not going to have a lot of sugar in your blood, um, and so your body is not going to produce a lot of insulin at that time. Um, so the point here is just an example of a protein that's um, produced at certain times and not others, um, and that's because that gene is getting expressed at certain times and not others. The gene is always there, it's just at certain times... Um, it's being uh, read, um, and we'll talk more about all of the details there, but at certain times it's being read um, and the instructions are going to the ribosome to make the proteins, at certain times it's not. So it's kind of like if I have a cookbook um, that has a chocolate chip cookie recipe, um, it's always in my kitchen, but that doesn't mean that I'm always making chocolate chip cookies. I'm only reading those instructions and following those uh, at a time that it would be appropriate to make chocolate chip cookies. Um, so the key proteins that we're talking about in terms of cell cycle regulation, it's not insulin, um, it's these uh, genes called cyclins. And the genes, um, the cyclin genes contain instructions for the cyclin proteins. Um, there's different cyclins that are associated with different phases of the cell cycle. So you can see in this graph, we have cyclins that rise and fall um, associated with the transitions um, between parts of the cell cycle. Um, and as you learned in the video, uh, cyclins cause the activation of other proteins, which lead to the key events of each phase of the cell cycle. So this is enormously complex. Like you could spend your entire um, PhD career investigating just one of these. Uh, but the short story is that cyclins um, are associated with proteins called CDKs, or cyclin-dependent kinases. And a kinase um, is a protein that phosphorylates another protein. So it adds a phosphate group to another protein. That's what a kinase does. And um, in phosphorylating that downstream protein, um, it activates that protein. So let me go back. Um, cyclin B um, is one of the cyclins associated with the beginning of mitosis. So there's many things that need to happen during mitosis. Um, so some of the things that this cyclin is involved with is um, the condensation of the DNA. So there's all kinds of proteins that are orchestrating the condensation of the DNA, the chromatin becoming more tightly wound for the um, chromosomes to condense during pro prophase. Um, another thing that's happening under the control of this cyclin is different proteins are involved in breaking down the nuclear membrane, also during prophase. So this um, is already an example of how this cyclin can have multiple effects. Another important thing that the cyclin is involved with um, is assembling the mitotic spindle. So making those microtubules um, that are going to line up the chromosomes for metaphase. So the spike of cyclin B um, recruits these cyclin-dependent kinases, which phosphorylate many different proteins that are involved in the events of mitosis. So let me summarize that again. Because of the increase of cyclin B, 
there are several downstream effects um, that result in the important steps that need to happen for mitosis to go forward. Um, similarly, cyclin E uh, spikes before S phase because it's involved in some of the proteins that are necessary for um, DNA replication. So you don't have to memorize this diagram. You don't have to you know, memorize any of these specific details. Um, but if I just say this to you, it's kind of hand wavy and I'm not really explaining to you what's going on. But the summary is that cyclins spike in association with different parts of the cell cycle um, and they cause the activation of the proteins that carry out the events of that phase of the cell cycle. All right, you're gonna go back to your notes document um, and do a little bit more reading about uh, proteins that are involved in cancer. So please pause this video and complete those notes. Um, in summary, here's some of our vocabulary. A primary tumor is cancer growing at its original site. A secondary tumor is cancer that is spread to other parts of the body. A mutagen is an agent that causes genetic mutation. So that could be um, radiation, that could be a toxic chemical, um, it could be UV light, you know, anything that can cause a genetic mutation. It could be x-rays. Um, and then an oncogene is a gene that, when mutated, can cause a normal cell to become a cancer cell. And then metastasis, like we said, is the development of secondary tumors. So this is sort of tricky to understand because it's the question is like why in our bodies would we have these oncogenes? So an oncogene is a mutated form of a normal gene called a proto-oncogene. So when a proto-oncogene becomes mutated, it's now called an oncogene. Um, and that leads to accelerated cell division. So this is sort of analogous to the accelerator pedal in a car. Like obviously you need an accelerator pedal or your car's not going to go anywhere. Um, but if you have a mutation in a proto-oncogene, it's like an accelerator pedal that's stuck down. So this is a car that's possibly speeding out of control um, because the normal positive regulators of cell division are overactive. So the proto-oncogene was the normal positive regulator of cell division. The oncogene is the mutated version um, that's causing this positive control to happen too fast. Um, another kind of gene is a tumor suppressor gene. So a tumor suppressor gene is um, a negative check on the cell cycle. So it's sort of like the brake pedal of a car. Um, and a tumor suppressor gene that's working properly um, is controlling the cell cycle um, by slowing it down or stopping it. But a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene um, is sort of like having a brake pedal that doesn't work. Um, so this mutated tumor suppressor gene is no longer doing its job of slowing down the cell cycle, um, and the cell cycle can proceed without regulation. So this image is just showing you that it almost always takes several mutations for cancer to develop. Um, that's why you know older people are much more likely to develop cancer, um, even though pediatric cancer is a is a tragic reality. Um, but if you look at you know, in the world who has cancer, it's almost always older people because they've had time in their lifetime for these mutations to build up. Um, a more fun, a happy application of these tumor suppressor genes is about elephants. Um, and it wasn't clear to scientists why elephants almost never get cancer, even though they are large animals and they're pretty long lived, um, but they're much more, much less likely to get cancer. So when they were able to finally study this, um, these African elephants have extra tumor suppressor genes. So that's pretty cool. Um, the last thing you can do is if you want to do more mitotic index practice, here's a micrograph. Here's one more where you can test your skill. Um, but that's it. So I'm going to be checking the warm questions, the amoeba sisters questions, the mitotic index questions, um, and any of the guided notes about cancer. Uh, if you have any questions about what I'm checking for, please feel free to email me. So that's part of what's due uh, with your next asynchronous deadline. 
The other thing that's due is your Unit 2 assessment. So that's a Google quiz. You can take it as many times as you want to to get the score that you're satisfied with. Um, that's going to be worth a lot in the gradebook because it's in that assessments category. Um, so, you know, it's to your benefit to retake that as many times until you get 100 or 95 or whatever you're happy with. Um, okay, I will see you next week. I hope you have a good weekend with your families.